You are listening to part 97 of our series, Seven Medicines, The Wise Woman Way, with Susan Wade at Time Monk Radio. Hello, Susan, and welcome to Time Monk Radio. Thank you, Gemini. Here we are entering the last month of our time together with the seven medicines, the last four weekly episodes, and then I am going to take a break from doing this as a regular monthly thing and actually sit down and write the book about the seven medicines. I'm calling it Abundantly Well, Making Sense of Medicine with the Seven Medicines. And I was talking to Gemini before the show and I said, you know, I don't think I'll even be able to put a a tenth of the information that we've gone over in these shows into the actual book. So this will be a great resource to come back to uh, year after year and to uh, really uh, mine through all the delicious information. In our uh, wrap-up shows here, what I want to do is kind of put uh, what we've learned into action. I'm certainly a bit of a philosopher, and um, I think that having a philosophy of, of health, a philosophy of medicine, is a very, very good idea. But we don't just want a philosophy, we want action. One of the reasons people tell me that they really like my books and refer to them is that they can take action from my book, the books, give them not just um, grim facts and scary figures, but uh, ways to actually move forward. So uh, that's what we're going to do here as we wrap up. I've got a collection of kind of interesting articles that haven't fit into any particular uh, box that we have created in Seven Medicines. Um, So I'm going to gather them together here at the end in a few very interesting books I want to call your attention to. And then we are going to look at how three different people actually use the Seven Medicines facing um, elective surgery, um, a broken bone, and a diagnosis of cancer. Fatal Medical Errors reads the headline, and there's a a bar chart graph there showing that medical errors kill between 250 and 400,000 Americans every year. Cancer kills between 500 and 650,000 Americans, so medical errors are right up there. And um, accidents uh, outside of medical accidents kill less than half of that. 130,000. So it's um, a big, big deal. You go into a hospital or a healthcare facility, you could get hurt by the very care that you go there to receive. So the patient's playbook by Leslie D. Mickelson, M-I-C-H-E-L-S-O-N, is right there to help you. She's a medical care management expert and a patient education advocate. And she shows you how to be a savvy patient and how to help yourself. And that's on the ground in the hospital. Meanwhile, there are computers and you are in those computers and your identity is in those computers. And there are people trolling around trying to get in there. As a matter of fact, about 44% of all data breaches involve records kept by doctor's offices, hospitals, pharmacies, and health insurance companies. Hmm. You need to check any explanation of benefits documents that you receive and call your healthcare provider immediately if you see any inaccuracies such as a visit that you didn't actually do. If you don't know who your provider is, for general identity theft resource help, call 888-400-5530. Protect yourself so that you can have a good mood because good moods mean good outcomes and bad moods mean mean bad outcomes, says Nadja Kadum, MD. When surveyed about their mood before undergoing a minimally invasive interventional radiology procedure, such as angioplasty or embolism, 
only 12% of the patients who reported feeling mildly scared, nervous, upset, or some other negative state had an adverse effect afterwards, such as bleeding or blood pressure changes, compared with 22% who reported those feelings as very, very strong. So put a smile on your face. I know that I really experienced that when I went to have my hernia repaired, which again was a uh, outpatient um, procedure, but uh, you know, nonetheless, surgery. Um, and I asked the people who loved me to be present with me, and I woke up into this this bath, this waterfall of love and care. And wow, it was like I had taken the biggest smile to heart. Conversation can comfort patients before surgery more than medication. French researchers assigned 50 hand surgery patients to receive either a standard relaxation drug or to have conversational hypnosis with no meds. So there were 50 in each group. 50 got the drug and 50 had no meds, and both groups had reg- regional anesthesia when they did the surgery. The conversational hypnosis is positive chatter, such as keep calm and quiet rather than please don't move, and it diverts attention to other topics. Those who received the conversational hypnosis were much more relaxed as measured by their heart rate and did better after surgery. Hmm. I have heard of operating theaters where they will let you choose the music that will be played for some people. That can make a very, very big difference. Sleep is such an important part of healing. We should be sure that when we're healing, we get good sleep. This is the thing that has most astonished me in every hospital I have ever been in, which is not very many, and that is they don't let you sleep. I remember my mother talking about this. She talked about when she was in the hospital after she had had me, and the nurse would come in at 3 a.m. and wake her up to ask if she wanted a sleeping pill. What can you do? You can ask your doctor if you can sleep through the night. And if that can be added to your chart that you should be allowed to sleep through the night. And if you can ask for that, surely you can ask not to be awakened at any particular time in the morning, but to allow yourself to awaken naturally. That's what healing sleep is. It's a sleep that ends on its own because you wake up. You can ask for what you need. And what you want. You don't have to go along with the rules. One way to get what you want is to talk to your doctor. I always find AARP, the American Association for Retired People, to be an excellent source of resources about health. Their magazine, the AARP Bulletin, is one that I always eagerly read and frequently find myself tearing articles out of how to talk so your doctor will listen. It's from the January-February 2017 issue. It suggests that we make an actual human connection with the doctor. Don't just jump in and tell tell the doctor what's wrong with you, actually ask about them. Stay on message. Remember, the doctor only has about 15 minutes to be with you, not the doctor's choice. So do treat the doctor as a person, exchange your pleasant trees, but don't get sidetracked. Get to the point. And when you're talking about what's going on with you, be specific But don't be too specific, if you get what I mean. And tell the whole truth. I know, it's really hard, isn't it? Things can be embarrassing. We can feel ashamed of things. But would you like to have to try to solve a puzzle in which 
part of the pieces had been hidden on purpose, don't keep things from your doctor. If you take any kind of drug, whether it's legal or illegal, best to tell your doctor. They've heard it before. If you're really uncomfortable about discussing things with your doctor, try writing it out or writing out some notes for yourself. And then you can look at the notes instead of look at the doctor. And and you can look up words so that you don't have to say, I pee my pants. You can look up the word incontinent and you can say, I mean incontinent, which is easier to say um, in terms of embarrassment. And that's why doctors use those kinds of words as well. Of course, you don't have to accept what the doctor says. If the doctor says it's nothing or it's aging or it's just because you're a woman, um, you, you don't have to accept that from the doctor. If there was a test that you thought you wanted, you could ask for that test. And if you really can't get any satisfaction, you'll need to do what many, many other people in your case have done, which is to go to another doctor. I think about the number of women with fibromyalgia who for a great many years went from doctor to doctor being told it was nothing until finally it became a diagnosable disease. Don't save your questions all until the very, very end. Ask your questions like throughout or, you know, even at the beginning. Um, What I will often do is simply say that I do have questions. Oh, I want to talk to you about this. And I have several questions that I want to ask you. Let's be sure to save time for those. I know as a teacher... And someone who listens to what's going on with people, that when someone says, I have three questions for you, that I kind of gauge myself in my answer to be sure that I have enough time to get to all of their questions. And along with being clear about what's really going on with you, you need to be clear about what you can actually afford. Most doctors do not have a clue. They don't. They really don't have a clue as to how much it's going to cost you or what you can afford. And um, some doctors don't even know which procedures and lab tests are covered. Um, But if you are honest and you say, I can't get this because my insurance doesn't cover it or I need a generic drug, Most doctors are really willing to work with you. Here's the bottom line for them. Medications taken mean to them your health is going to improve. Medications not taken for any reason, including not being able to afford them, means your health is not going to improve. And believe it or not, those doctors really do want your health to improve. makes them feel good, too. And... uh, And this article ends with, be sure that you have that end-of-life discussion. Talk to your family about what you want and talk to your doctor, too. Writing it down as part of an advanced directive isn't enough. People also have to hear it from you. And do be sure to check out the AARP Bulletin for September 2017, which is focused on finding the best surgeon, the best doctor, and the best hospital. Wow. Now, I will admit that when I'm asked who my primary care physician is, I say Mother Earth. But most people like to have a doctor. It feels good to them. So here's what people that they have asked are saying you should think about. And I like the way they did it. Rather than just have one person write the article, they actually went to practitioners physicians, surgeons, and so on. A great doctor considers the whole person, says one. Fancy tests are great, but remember that most doctors run more tests 
than they need to. A good doctor listens to the whole story before making a decision. Would you want you as your doctor? A doctor told me he asked the head nurse when he went to the ER for chest pain. I thought it was a brilliant question. The nurses know. Who would you want as your doctor? I asked the head nurse when I went to the ER for chest pain. I thought it was a brilliant question. The nurses know. Should I say it again? Ask. Ask the nurses. They know. Where you've trained doesn't always represent how good you are as a physician. Slowing down is really, really hard hard because we're trained to go fast, but when we do slow down and pay closer attention, we pick up on many more things and our care of you is much better. Medicine is always changing. If the doctor says they've always done it that way, that doesn't mean it has to be done that way right now. As you say, this is a very interesting issue here, your critical health decisions, how to find the best surgeon, the best doctor, and uh, the best hospital. Now, a few books that I would like to give you a little mini book reports on and encourage you to think about exploring these books. Dr. Carolyn Dean wrote a book called Death by Modern Medicine. And I'm especially fond of this blurb. It says, opinions are made of silver, but facts are made of gold. This book is a gold mine. I've been very lucky to know Dr. Carolyn Dean and to know her quite well. And I certainly will admit to being influenced by um, her beliefs. Chapter one, death by modern medical doctors. Chapter two, death by drug companies. Chapter three, death by the health care bureaucracy. Chapter four, death by media. Chapter 5, Death by Propaganda. Chapter 6, Death by Modern Procedures. Chapter 7, Death by Modern Science. Chapter 8, Death by Cancer Incorporated. Chapter 9, Death by Modern Chemicals. Chapter 10, Death by Sugar. Chapter 11, Death by Addiction. Chapter 12, Death by Denial. And Chapter 13, Death by Lifestyle. Wow. For quite a while, I really encouraged um, all of my apprentices to get a copy of this book and to spend some time with it. I think it's really important if we're engaging in alternative medicine, in integrative medicine, and in complementary medicines, to be clear that what we're doing isn't anywhere near as dangerous as what they're doing. Again, Carolyn Dean has not written a book about what she thinks is happening, what she believes is happening, what she is paranoid might be happening. She has written a book which is based on solid, solid facts about what's actually going on in modern medicine. And she's Canadian, where, in fact, it's softer than it is in America. 
91% of cancer patients seek some form of alternative medicine, according to Dr. Ralph Moss, PhD, says Dr. Carolyn Dean, but there are rarely any presentations at conferences on alternative care. It's one of the reasons that I'm going to take a couple of week break from my work on writing the book this winter. And with my daughter, we are going to create another video course for you. And the theme of that video course is alternative and integrative care for those who have a diagnosis of cancer. Whether you want to use herbs to directly get rid of your cancer, whether you want to use herbs to help yourself deal with chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery, we're going to be offering you all of the very, very best. One of um, my friends who is currently doing both radiation and chemotherapy uh, got in touch this morning and said that the nurses were astonished because his blood levels of minerals are so unchanged. And they said usually after a month of uh, radiation and chemotherapy treatment, the blood is really shot and they could hardly imagine how healthy his blood was and how it had gotten that way. And he, of course, sent me a wink and a hooray for our friends, the nourishing herbal infusions. I don't know uh, the author of this book, Harvey Biggleson, M.D., but I do like his premise. Doctors are more harmful than germs. How surgery can be hazardous to your health and what to do about it. In this book, Dr. Harvey Biggleson shows that common medical practices cause many chronic long-term health problems. When we try to eliminate symptoms and germs, especially through surgery and procedures that cause damage to the body, then we have not actually healed anything. He suggested instead of looking at a sick person as a set of symptoms, as an illness, as an isolated in, uh, event, we must look for a new paradigm that treats each person as an individual and to look at what's happening with the whole living human body, provocatively written and radical in its pre- approach. Doctors are more harmful than germs, challenges you and all healing professionals to rethink everything you believe about illness and how it is best dealt with. Remember way back at the beginning when we were talking about story medicine. We have serenity medicine, story medicine, mind medicine, lifestyle medicine, alternative medicine, pharmaceutical medicine, and high-tech medicine. So all the way back to story medicine, I suggested that right at the beginning, right when we're going for a diagnosis, is one of the most important times in what's going to happen to us because it's at that time that we decide, I'm going to accept the story of modern medicine or I'm not going to accept the story of modern medicine. The part of the new paradigm, part of the new approach that is available to all of us is a a very interesting aspect of the wise woman tradition called the Darwinian approach to medicine. And the book, Survival of the Sickest, Why We Need Disease, by Dr. Sharon Molem, is a book about Darwinian medicine. Dr. Molem will refocus everything you thought you knew about disease and how to treat it. She considers herself a medical maverick. And she wants 
to tell you that a spoonful of sugar helps the temperature go down, that the cholesterol also rises, that we can jump into the gene pool, and that we can find in that gene pool that there is a reason for us to be sick. You m- might remember when we were talking about antipsychotic drugs and we talked about why things like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia uh, seem to remain with us and seem to affect a, a, a pretty consistent, if not large, amount of the population. And that one of the reasons, according to Darwinian medicine, is that the alleles that the gene forms that um, create schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, uh, when they are not paired Uh, lead to very powerful creativity. So you'll remember back to Mendelssohn and the peas. If you have a mother who has a gene for schizophrenia and a father who has a gene for schizophrenia, they will have one child who has no gene for schizophrenia. They will have two children who have a single gene for schizophrenia and won't express it, and they will have one child who has two genes for schizophrenia and will express it. It turns out that those two with the one gene will be incredibly creative and that that is the reason that we keep such genes in our genotype. There are reasons for the things that are going on with us. To me, this is one of the most nourishing aspects of the wise woman tradition that I don't have to think of my body as betraying me. I don't have to think of my body as malfunctioning. I don't have to think of my body as bad. I don't have to jump in and do battle with what's going on, I can take a step back and say, what's right about this? How can what's going on here right now be used for my greater health? What choices are available to me that give me more of what I'm looking for? So, Often, because we start with a story of betrayal, with a story of my body doesn't work right, so often then we become ashamed and embarrassed and willing to follow the standard treatment, willing to follow the usual protocol. On one hand, modern medicine says, each and every one of you is unique, and that's true. But on the other hand, modern medicine has standard procedures and standard protocols because modern medicine, of course, is managed by insurance companies. And insurance companies want to make sure that everything is legal and all the T's are crotted and the I's are dotted. But perhaps you're the kind of person who likes to cross your T's higher, make a big long T bar across your T. I'm hoping that the information that I have given you in these talks about the seven medicines will help you to reclaim as much power over your own health as you want. I was thinking about what I needed to say about fear as I closed our sessions together about the the seven medicines because I see that so frequently that people make their health decisions based on fear. And I always ask myself, Susan, do you make good decisions when they're based on fears, and so far, I must admit that the answer has always been no. I make very poor decisions when my decision is based on fear. So I'm hoping that in addition to my words and some motherwort, that you will find in small and large ways your power if your own health reclaimed so that when it comes to big things like broken bone surgery and cancer, you can do what we've been talking about. Use the seven medicines to make sense of medicine and get the care that is uniquely you. 
I'll be back in the coming weeks to talk to you about how three people used the seven medicines to deal with some major health issues. Thanks so much for being with me. Green blessings, Gemini. Thank you so much, Susan. And this concludes part 97 of our series, The Seven Medicines, The Wise Woman Way, with Susan Wade at Time Monk Radio.